going over the historical setting for Corinthians and for Paul's extraordinary emphasis on a crucified Messiah, on a on that on a teaching that God would display his greatest power for salvation, deliverance, and everything else through himself in the person of Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying. The wisdom of God in weakness. The wisdom of God as foolishness to the carnal man, to the natural man. <clears throat> All right. And we were discussing verses 29 through 31 in our last class. <clears throat> Verse 29 says that no flesh should glory in his presence, verse 30 and on, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. All right, so I've been just trying to stick with pretty much reading here so that we could get through this so that we will get further into this class, into the book, into the chapters than we ever have in the history of the earth. <laughs> you know what? I forgot again. I think we can do it now. Um, hopefully this might apply to some who are watching this, but Jennifer has a word from the Lord, and uh, I think it would be appropriate for her to come up here and just share it with us. And I forgot, so we're going to do it right now, this moment. Um. Well, this is just something the Lord spoke to my heart, and I felt like I may not be the only one that it applies to, and so I wanted to share it for whomsoever it applies to, but um, I just felt like the Holy Spirit kind of said, you know, we have something to say about what you're going through, <laughs> or, you know, all the drama and turmoil that I, we, you know, can get into in ourselves, but um, he said, to my heart, the Father would say, the work is finished. I see you without spot or blemish. I see my son when I look at you. The son, our husband, would say to us, his bride, I see your heart. I see your heart as you draw near to me, striving to be with me. But do not neglect to find my heart in the way I would have you proceed. And the Holy Spirit would say, I love to reveal the Son. I love to guide you in the way. We build upon the laid foundation, the finished work of the cross of Christ, rest. The faith of the Son, that life comes out of death, not out of striving. And faith in union that rest and peace is our natural state with the Lord. And um, I'm not going to add to that. I'm just going to go. See, and you just thought you are going to be bored this whole class. <laughs> <laughs> and also, though we said something earlier, it didn't go over the recording, but... Uh, happy birthday to Greg Valle. We love you, brother. All right. So the way that Paul conceives the cross is that Christ crucified is central. He is what is central. And Paul concludes that as we boast and cleave only to him and cleave to our union with him, he then becomes our wisdom and our righteousness, and our sanctification, and our redemption. 
He becomes this wisdom and method of approach within us. In other words, we believed him, we believed the cross, but that union does more than give us, you know, that union makes him these things unto us. If there had been no union, we would only receive these things as a teaching from a distance. And uh, that's the glory of the fact that Jesus left this earth and rose from the dead and said, you know, I'll come again, but not in the same form. I will no longer just be your teacher. I will be your life, and you'll be one with me. <clears throat> All right, so um, <clears throat> he is the one that's raised. Therefore, because we're joined, this becomes the means whereby he has made redemption unto us. Christ crucified is our means of redemption and by union becomes our redemption. And this is, this is one of the things we are trying to point out last class, that Christ, is, Christ crucified is our means of redemption. But when we become joined with him, he becomes our redemption. <clears throat> Uh, we've seen how in verse 31, the apostle addresses the need to lift up the way of Christ crucified to such a degree that it is what we literally boast in. But in chapter 2, he moves from presenting the doctrinal reality of the hidden wisdom of God unto how he demonstrates Christ crucified in a practical way. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. We are uh, getting real close here to jumping into chapter 2. And <clears throat> Paul is... Um, going to show in chapter 2 that this isn't just something Jesus did on the cross. This is something Jesus did on the cross in him as his way, not just his message. As his life, not just his teaching. As his reality and how he proceeds. <clears throat> I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but that's what we're we're about to get into. <clears throat> this is seen in the beginning of the verses, uh, verses of chapter two, in that he rejects the wisdom of self-promotion. Well, you can we can look at that. Uh, chapter two, verse one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and. Uh, and him crucified, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And remember verse 18 of the first chapter has already declared the cross as the power of God, and also verse uh, 22 or 23 in that same chapter. All right, so <clears throat> uh, Paul embracing this way of Christ crucified <clears throat> um, demonstrates that in rejecting self-promotion, in rejecting the use of persuasive words by refusing to come before them to impress them with words of wisdom. I think that's significant to us here. To refuse to try to do that with impressive words or I, I put persuasive word usage. Because <laughs> word usage should not be the persuasive tool. He is declaring that his method of coming to them in weakness is Christ crucified, and that's the power. Does that make any sense? <clears throat> Probably can't. It's gone from me. No, just that. <laughs> and you know what? If that's gone from me, I'm in real trouble. <laughs> um. Paul refusing to come with using persuasive word usage um, because he has come to them in a spirit of weakness and <clears throat> what he calls 
knowing Christ crucified. And he believes that's the power that makes the difference. All right, so to Paul to come to them with wisdom of words is not just a preference he chooses not to take in his approach to preaching. To him, it is a much more serious matter than that. He says, this is, ver this is chapter 1, verse 17, and I'll read it to you. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So he says to do so, to come with enticing words to do so, will actually void out the cross. All right. In Paul's mind, this is no small thing. Let's consider what he means by that. He appears to be saying that if one uses other methods for accomplishing what God wants, we are voiding out the cross of Christ in our lives. Okay, can you see that that's true? Because, you know, <clears throat> I personally would not conclude that such acts voids out our salvation, but it does call into question our very understanding of what took place at the cross and what was the means by which we are saved. Okay, well, there's more. Why would we knowingly embrace the wisdom of God as seen as the power and weakness demonstrated by Christ's selfless giving of himself at the cross, yet turn around and reject that kind of wisdom as a viable method for us to proceed according unto? Why, why would we do that? A question that someone really comprehends <laughs> The true reality there, okay? All right, Paul seeks to communicate to them that his message and his method are one and the same. So instead of coming with words that would persuade them or strength of presentation, he came even as Christ crucified appeared in weakness and powerlessness demonstrated by trembling and as a servant. This he presents to them as a contrast to any other ministry that they might be favoring that is not founded on Christ crucified. Not just in doctrine, but in presentation also. In other words, there, you have to remember, and this is one of the things that I think we get off from as Christians, is we read a little bit and then we lose what went before. He's still talking and he's still dealing, and we'll see this because it keeps popping up in chapter 2 and chapter 3. He's still dealing with the divisions based, the divisions the Corinthian church is having based on man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. And he's still pressing his point here. <clears throat> um, in other words, Paul's concept here of to know Christ crucified among them, verse 2, actually directly relates to what he perceives as the spirit of his ministry in contrast to them who glory in men. In parentheses, because that's, that's the phrase that's used there, who glory in men. <clears throat> Thus far, Paul has presented the wisdom of God as seen in number one. He's presented the wisdom, God, of, the wisdom of God as seen first, God's own method, or Christ's own method for reaching mankind by use of his own demise. Number two, God's choosing of the Corinthian outcast based on his supposed foolish wisdom that confounds the wise. Number three, Paul's own way of ministry based upon self-abasement that comes in weakness. Are you with it? So what we, we're, we're describing his, what he's been sharing so far. Paul's reason for writing this letter is that the Corinthians do not seem to comprehend that the wisdom that they are operating according unto in choosing one man above another is causing division that is tearing down the temple of God and is totally contrary to the crucified one with whom they claim allegiance. Unbelievably, these believers had come to a place where they thought they were spiritually mature Whereas Paul saw anyone who did not emphasize Christ crucified in doctrine uh, and in spirit as babies. And that's in chapter 3. We'll be getting there. <clears throat> this Corinthian church boasted in its spiritual gifts. But Paul connects the spirit with that of revealing Christ crucified. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither did enter into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
He warns them that having the Spirit without God's emphasis on the cross can lead to a wisdom that seeks to be superior, which led to the crucifying of the Lord of glory, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> he warns them that having the Spirit without the emphasis on the cross leads to a wisdom that seeks to be superior, which led to the crucifying of the Lord of glory. Notice how he links God's wisdom with Christ going to the cross, and he links man's wisdom as making others go to the cross. <laughs> Later in chapter 10, Paul also uses Israel as an example of this, where he shows that the Jews came out, saw the miracles, and drank of the Spirit, but with all that, God was still not pleased. That's chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. We'll get into that, verse 1 through 5. From this, we might conclude that God has something more for us beyond providing his supernatural care. <clears throat> to try to convey the difference between knowing the movements of the Spirit and knowing the essence of God, Paul presents us with a certain picture. The portrait that he paints for us says, it is by means of a person's spirit that one can find the true essence of a person and not by his deeds alone. In like manner, only God's spirit can convey the true knowledge of God constitutionally. All right, so that's, that's what, verse uh, 10 and 11. For, uh, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Okay? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world but the Spirit who is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. <clears throat> um, see. The wisdom of God <clears throat> as found only in Christ crucified must be conveyed spirit to spirit. For it does not require just a mental grasp. One who truly qualifies as spiritual does not just have the knowledge of Christ, but the mind of Christ. And that's uh, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> this means that the spirit and the cross have been linked together in such a way that God's true wisdom has brought a person into true living conformity to the way and wisdom of Christ crucified. A major point of emphasis in 1 Corinthians is that there be no divisions among them. The way he hopes to reach that goal is that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. This is 1 Corinthians 1.10. That same mind is being described here as the mind of Christ in, in chapter 2, verse 16, which corresponds to us having the same attitude and approach of Jesus concerning the cross. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you. See, that's the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. So when I said that his desire is that there be no divisions among you, 1 Corinthians 1.10, he goes on to say that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Let this mind be in you, okay? <clears throat> Good. And I realize you may not be getting every ounce of this, but... Right, what really what we're doing, we're really not doing anything different than we did before, but now we're laying uh, this history over it and you're beginning to see it from a basis of reality and life as Paul understood it as he approached this. All right, now let's look in uh, chapter 3. Gosh, I can feel it. We're getting close to chapter 4. All right. Chapter 3, let's read verse 1 through 4. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for to this time you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as babe? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So... Anybody see that this explanation of 
milk and meat, solid food, uh, babes and mature, is still all along this same line of the wisdom that the Corinthians have had saying, I'm of this person and I'm of that, and not comprehending that all of this is uh, supposed to be pertaining to Christ crucified and that the, the babe mentality is still has the wisdom of this world. And the mature mentality is the mind of Christ. Christ crucified. The mind of selfless giving. Okay? So this little part right here, people have used it. I have others in a wrong context. And I admit my failures. All right. In chapter 3, the apostle brings all of these teachings and living examples to bear on the Corinthians. He addresses the simple act of divisions between brethren as the proving ground as to if a person is carnal or spiritual based solely on their proximity to Christ crucified as a way of life. He concludes that what is consistent with being spiritual is that which is based upon the wisdom of God. And if so, then the wisdom of God is seen at the cross in the form of weakness and not fighting for its own rights. Well, I wasn't going to go on unless I got, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I actually was looking for that little microphone in the recorder that we usually have up here because it's, and I'm going, well, where would it go? So I was pausing because of that, but, but thank you for going. He needs encouragement. <laughs> Kelly's back there going, I think I can go on. <laughs> Ridiculous. <clears throat> All right. Um, even those who claim to be of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 12, because some said, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Some said, I am of Christ. Even those who claim to be of Christ have divided from the others because the cross has been left out of the equation. They serve a crossless Christ. However, allegiance to Christ crucified settles all claims. <clears throat> all right, from verse 5 of chapter 3 on into chapter 4. Somebody's car is beeping. Somebody's breaking into your car. <clears throat> Here. If my truck was out there, I would get it going right now, but <clears throat> it's not. All right. <clears throat> all right, we read verses 1 through 4. From verse 5 all the way through chapter 3, even into chapter 4, the apostle begins to no longer address the Corinthians but now he's going to address the ministers. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of, okay. <clears throat> um, so he's going to address the ministers with whom the Corinthians have taken sides. He sets out to paint a picture of God's ministers, which includes himself, Peter, meaning Cephas, and Apollos, as servants instead of as men above other men with whom sides should be taken. Uh, maybe I should... Uh, read this so that you can get the import of what I'm saying. Verse, we're just going to read 5 through 8. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers? That's the word servants, folks. By whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. The Lord gave those servants. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. All right, so in verse 5 through 8 of this third chapter, based on his own admonition that he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, he shows that it is only God who gave, who, who gave any increase. <clears throat> verse 8 shows that any glory or reward do these ministers will come when they stand before the Lord to give an account. Therefore, all glory should be removed from them and placed on the Lord at this present time. 
Remember, every man shall give, receive his own reward according to his labor, right? Doesn't it say that? So he's saying, don't be giving them that reward. Let Jesus do that. They're servants, right? Uh, also in verse 8, we notice that Paul presents these ministers not just as servants, as mentioned in verse 5, but beyond that of servants. By virtue of being joined to Christ, these servants are also one. That union with the Lord assumes that Christ will become all and in all as far as his ministers are concerned. If, if all uh, ministers have become one with the Lord, then the one gets the glory, and that one is Christ. <clears throat> all right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, verse 10 and 11 and trust that you know the rest of it. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth on it. But let every man take heed how he buildeth upon it. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right. Um, in verse, verses 10 through 15, Paul sets out to make a point concerning his emphasis upon Christ and him crucified. These verses are set forth for him to make a point about his emphasis. Contrary to others who lift themselves up, he feels that his emphasis is important, not based on him or his style, but based upon the level of value of his focus on Christ, on Christ crucified. Remember, Paul came to Corinth first, right? He was the one used to lay the foundation there. Verse 10 says that. He defines that foundation as Christ and him crucified. After he left that region, or that region, others came and ministered there, right? He was the first one. He raised up the church, and when he left, others, such as Apollos or whoever else, they came behind him. They came adding other things to the apostles' teaching, but the foundation of Christ and him crucified, according to Paul, was not replaceable. Verse 11. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Uh, I'm going to read, but I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a distinction that I didn't make when we had the end of the tabernacle class when I shared on this stuff. I'm going to make a distinction between verses 12 through 15 in contrast to verses... <laughs> verse 16 and 17 because I didn't see it before and I'm a bundle of new stuff that refutes everything I just saw <laughs> so don't trust anything I say only trust the Lord <clears throat> we're in chapter 3 and we're going to be examining verse 12 through 15 as one set and verse 16 and 17 as another set All right. so listen carefully in light of that as we get into the middle part of Paul's discourse in this third chapter, there seems to be a difference between verses 12 through 15 in contrast with verses 16 and through 17. In the first part, there is the possibility of others applying shoddy material to God's building, right? Everybody know those scriptures? <clears throat> if these other ministers do this, then their work will be destroyed, yet they shall be saved. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. Right? <clears throat> okay, everybody in agreement with that? However, at verse 16, the analogy changes from just being a building to becoming the temple of God, and the issue seems to have changed from that of adding shoddy materials to that of defiling the temple with the wisdom of this age. <clears throat> Do you at least see the contrast that I'm making? <clears throat> Okay, uh, which results in God destroying that person. To open God's people up to the wisdom of man is to cause a rift with those who embrace the wisdom of God as seen in weakness. This opens the door to the possible destruction of the temple, which is the church. Okay, and um, so he changed that analogy totally. It was a building, and then you can add shoddy material, but you'll be okay. But then he starts saying... You know, now we're talking about the temple of God, and you, some, somebody in that Corinthian church has been using the wisdom of man, saying, well, you know, he's a better person. We ought to go listen to him or trust him. And don't listen to Paul, you know, and all his negative emphasis on the cross. And you see what I'm saying? And Paul is saying, 
man, you're dealing with the temple of God now, and you're putting something in there that you could be destroyed over. You see that? Okay. All right, verses 18 through 20. Um, Let's just read it. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is... Do you see how that immediately follows on the, the thing about the temple and destroying it and everything? You see? I mean, that, that, I'm not just saying that. It's really the context. Um, he, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men... For all, let's see, let me make sure I don't jump too far ahead. Yeah, we'll go ahead. For let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you're Christ, and Christ is God's. All right. I can almost smell chapter 4. In verses 18 through 20, his admonition continues to the ministers. He encourages the Corinthian ministers to reacquaint themselves with the wisdom of God found in a crucified existence. That wisdom will reinstate them as a servant or as a fool. Doesn't it say that? Let him become a fool that he may be wise. Meaning let him embrace the wisdom of God as seen in weakness and in foolishness. Okay. So he's saying that you'll be reinstated as a servant, that is, as a fool. <laughs> if they do not choose this, then they put themselves on the judgment end of God's dealing, whereby God will publicly expo expose the foolishness of that minister's wisdom and way of proceeding. In verses 21 and 22, he sets the order forth. Do not glory in men who are yours in that they are given to you of God in order to serve you. But in verse 23, he stresses that the Corinthians are not to forget that they are Christ's and are to serve him just as Jesus lives to serve the purposes of God. Do you see that there? I mean, it is there. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've always wondered what those scriptures mean. <laughs> I mean I'm, okay, what is that? You were Paul's, Paul's, da 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 da. But he's saying, you know, um, whether Paul or Cephas or da 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 da, they, um, therefore, let no man, for all things are yours. We are all your ministers. We're servants. We're literal slaves, self imposed slaves for the kingdom of God. That's who a, mini a true minister is. And. But don't forget that you too, the one who is being served by these ministers, you too belong to Christ and you're his slaves. <laughs> and if you need a pattern, it came from Jesus because he serves the Father. And that's what it's saying and that's what it's bringing out here. So, <clears throat> all right. So, all are of one, Christ, and the nature of that one is to serve others. All are of one. All the people all the Corinthians, all the ministers, Jesus. It's all of one, and that nature fills all. Okay? All right. Chapter 4. We are going to uh, make a little foray into chapter 4. Um, let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. <clears throat> in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul continues this thought of servanthood as concerning what must become our attitude and our way. Now, when I say servanthood, folks, I'm talking about Philippians 2, where Jesus you know, thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God, emptied himself of any privileges that he would have as God, <clears throat> became as a man, and as a man became a servant, not just to God, a slave, self-imposed slave, not just to God, but, um, uh, you know, you see, you see, for example, I mean, I'm picturing Jesus... <clears throat> the Last Supper, and he gets done, and, 
you know, and he and it says, and Jesus, knowing who he is, and where, he's the son of God, he's the eternal God who created everything, he, the, threw the universe into existence and everything, <clears throat> takes off his robe, girds himself, begins to wash their feet, and says, as, I, as you, you see what I do here? This is God. You see what I do here? Do it likewise to one another. Okay. Self-imposed slavery, folks. If you have the wisdom of the world, you would never get down there and do that because that immediately puts you under someone else that you're afraid might lord over you or something like that. I mean, you know, do you think anybody lorded over Jesus in lowering himself? Well, then if you don't, you have no clue what Jesus went through. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so he continues his thought of servanthood as concerning what must become our attitude and our way. As stewards, all are accountable. Okay. In that they serve someone above them and answer to them. They must be faithful to the views, needs, and desires of the one to whom they have placed themselves as servants. We have seen in chapter 3 that part of their stewardship involves accountability concerning what they put into God's temple. Okay. <clears throat> At this point, I will skip verses 4 and 5 so that we may hurry on into the most important part of chapter 4, verse 6. <clears throat> and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For one against another. Okay. This, uh, let's see. Verse 6 is where Paul states that all of these things mentioned up to this point, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, <laughs> All of these things mentioned up to this point are meant to be applied to the present situation concerning divisions over Paul and Apollos as well as others. The last section of his sharing where the emphasis was turned from the Corinthians to the ministers was meant to bring those of Corinth to one conclusion. Don't think of God's slaves more highly than what the Lord has set them to be. If this is done properly, then the end result will be that brothers will no longer be prideful over one against another servant. Okay. In verse 7, did I read verse 7? Oh, got to read verse 7. For who maketh thee to, di to differ from another? And what hast thou, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Folks, if that verse could just get melted into your being, there is nothing to boast in. If I have anything, if you have anything, it came from God. It's not me. It's not of me. It is not a, a testimony of how great I am. <laughs> not that I have anything to, you know. But if I did... It's not some sort of testimony of me. It's a testimony of the Lord. And if what I have came from the Lord and what you have came from the Lord, then we give all glory to the Lord. Amen? All right. So in verse 7, he turns the admon admonition from the ministers back to the people who chose sides over other ministers. He makes the same case concerning the church members that he did with the ministers. If everyone got what they have freely from God and no one earned it, then what makes anyone better than anyone else? Paul has already stated that if uh, glory or boasting is to be handed out, it should be handed to the Lord. Why? Because nothing of ourselves can bring him honor except that which he has has first passed on and imparted to us by Christ. However, take note that it is not the gift or ability displayed that gives God honor, but Christ through whom it came. <clears throat> All right. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a very brief 
description of my favorite parts of this, this chapter. Um, we'll read through, how much time we got? Okay, we'll read through verses nine, uh, let's see, verses uh, eight through 13. <clears throat> now you are full, now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle, spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are the, you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. <clears throat> all right. In verses eight through 13, Paul now gives his full explanation in a practical context of what he means by Christ and him crucified and knowing nothing else among them. What we just read. He also gives in these verses a running definition and example of the wisdom of God with the contrasting definition and example of the wisdom of this age. For him to walk in the wisdom that is foolishness is to live in conformity to the crucified in terms of loss sacrifice, suffering, while embracing the way of weakness. Unlike his days when he persecuted the church, he now renounces power and force as a means of accomplishing his ends. He now sees his present sufferings as the sufferings of Christ because in willingly giving up all rights, reputation, and honor due, he is assaulted on a greater level than he would have otherwise. And just as in Jesus' death, his, his is premised upon love for those whom he seeks to reach. <clears throat> um, in verse 9, he stands on the verge of showing forth that to be a true servant and steward will require that each take his place as those who are of Christ crucified's way. When con contrasted to the wisdom in which the Corinthians are presently moving, he chooses to be seen as foolish and weak while they strive to be perceived as wise and strong. Verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. <clears throat> as God's vessels, Paul and his group are the earth's garbage cans. He did not proclaim these things concerning how badly they have been treated in order that the Corinthians would see how much they have suffered for Jesus and respect them. Nor was he simply relating the trials that come as a result of being a minister of God. He is giving these things as proofs that his ministry, lifestyle, and doctrine are approved strictly on the basis of its alignment with Christ crucified. All right, we'll develop that more next time. And then let's just look at verse 14 and 15. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers, for in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. So in verses 14 and 15, he explains that as their spiritual father, they are out from this spirit. This being so then, in verse 16, he calls his children, children in the cross to follow him in this way of the Lamb. It is similar to 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be imitators of me just as I am about imitating Christ crucified in all things, in all of, uh, imitating Christ crucified in all of my choices. All right, so we have we have broken the sound barrier. We have done it. 
Is it finished? No, that was my introduction to 1 Corinthians. Now we shall get into stuff. Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit who alone is able to break the bread of life. Pray that there would abide on us a holy hush of our spirit as we go through these days listening carefully to your word, to the impressions that you're trying to give us, calling to remembrance, Jesus, calling to remembrance, Christ crucified, and seeing him as the pattern and the life that produces the pattern in us. I pray your greatest blessings on the rest of the word in 1 Corinthians as we proceed forward now. I pray that you'll open our eyes, break our hearts, and yet release incredible joy into us that is coming from you at just the prospect of sitting and listening to your word, Jesus, sitting at your feet, not in a classroom, not sitting here with me, but sitting at your feet. and hearing the wisdom that you ordained before the world to our glory. Make it real, make it life, make it Christ, in Jesus' name, amen.